Welcome to Making a Murderer Rubber Ducky YouTube channel. Thank you guys so much for joining us with part two of Game of Bones Deception of the Pelvic Bone Fragments created and presented by Dr. Silkman. Welcome everyone to part two of my presentation. My name is Dr. Silkman and the presentation is entitled Game of Bones Deception of the Pelvic Bone Fragments and if you could remember from part one essentially the main points from part one were that cremains were from one individual the human cremains were found in three separate geolocations uh, the cremains were fragmented and burnt to the same degree in all three separate locations. What I'd like to have a look at in part two is how the state and the defense were able to address the fact that there were human cremains found in three completely different locations and also to examine if the state had used any form of deception for the judge and for the jury. Now let's have a look at the state's perspective and how they handled the fact that there were multiple human cremains located in different locations. Now prosecutor Ken Kratz at the Stephen Avery trial stated the following we could start with the moment or with the visual or with the image of that man Stephen Avery standing outside of a big bonfire with flames over the roof or at least over the garage roof and the silhouette of Stephen Avery with the bonfire in the background and the observations made by some witnesses so let me hold you right there, Mr. Kratz. I believe he was trying to provide this type of image. In other words, that Stephen Avery was standing in front of a massive bonfire. And he stated that there was this massive bonfire with huge flames because some of the witnesses had stated so. Well, I like to remind everyone that the witness that he was predominantly relying upon was none other than Scott Tadich. And of course, when Scott Tadich was uh, interviewed, he was interviewed several times, and every time he was interviewed, the flames that he described that were present in the burn pit got higher and higher and higher. I can, I'll continue. Can you all picture that? Can you picture that as a moment, as a moment in time? And that moment, by the way, although dramatic and although important, should tell the whole story. That moment of Stephen Avery after the murder was committed, of Stephen Avery tending the fire, of Stephen Avery disposing of and mutilating the body, of 25 year old Teresa Hallbach. So it's pretty obvious that from the state's perspective, uh, the Stephen Avery burn pit was the primary location of where uh, Teresa Hallbach's body was burnt. Nowhere else. He did not address the bones in any other locations. And the picture and image that he was trying to present was that there was a massive bonfire in Stephen Avery's burn pit. Of course, if we examine the reality, we can see that the burn pit, in actual fact, was very close to his doghouse, to the doghouse, and also to an extremely large propane tank, and also his garage. And his sister's uh, residence was not too far away either. And so if there was this massive 
bonfire going on, it's likely he would have caught fire to the doghouse, the garage, and probably blown up the propane tank. So remember, Ken Kratz is relying on the um, testimony of Scott Tadich. All right, so with the same situation, let's have a look at the defense's perspective. So attorney Buting in the Stephen Avery trial stated, because if that body was burned elsewhere and then moved and dumped on Mr. Avery's burn pit, then Stephen Avery is not guilty, plain and simple because no one would burn a body somewhere else and then move the remains and dump them in your own backyard. No one would do that. Now that's why the state has gone to such trouble avoiding the fact that the bones were moved. That's why you heard nothing about it here, because it does not fit with their theory that Avery is guilty. They know that if you come to believe that there is reasonable doubt about whether those bones were moved to Mr. Avery's backyard, then you're going to find him not guilty. And of course, what Attorney Buting was referring to was this, that the human cremains were found in three separate geolocations, including, of course, on the Manitowoc County gravel pit. So you can see that both the state and the defense gave a totally different perspective on the location of the human cremains. The state basically ignored the bones at the Manitowoc County gravel pit. So how did Ken Kratz use deception? This is how we did it. The bones were moved, but they were moved by Mr. Avery. These bones in the quarry, I'm going to take about 20 seconds to talk about because the best anyone can say is that they are possible human. What does possible human mean? Well, it means we don't know what it is, all right? The best anthropologists in the world don't know what these bones are. Dr. Eisenberg didn't know what they were. Dr. Fairgreave didn't know what they were. He agreed with that. I continue. And you heard a stipulation being read to you by a person by the name of Leslie McCurdy. Stipulation just means an agreement between the parties that these bones, we felt it important enough was sent out to the FBI and Les McCurdy from the FBI determined that these bones were so degraded that they were in such a shape that even through testing, what's called mitochondrial DNA testing, whether they are human or not, could not even by the FBI be determined. So have a look what Ken Kratz states next. So the bones in the quarry are really not evidence in this case. And so Mr. Strang has made a big deal out of showing you maps and a little flag and things like that about possible bones. Again, speculation, conjecture is not part of this case. Facts are going to be what decides this case. So hence, Attorney Kratz was able to minimize and trivialize any other human cremains, especially those at the Manitowoc County gravel pit, by stating that what does possible human mean? And he even went so far as to say that those particular bones were not evidence in this case. And this all came about because Dr. Eisenberg called them possible or suspect human fragments, not human fragments. There was no way that Dr. Eisenberg was going to hand over to the defense the biggest trump card that they could pull. And that is that there were human pelvic cut bone fragments 
in the Manitowoc County gravel pit. It's interesting that Attorney Kratz said, speculation, conjecture is not part of this case. Yet, much of the state's case against Stephen Avery and also Brendan Dacey was all based on speculation and conjecture. All right, so Dr. Eisenberg was questioned about the iliac blade found at the Manitowoc County uh, gravel pit and Special Prosecutor Fallon in the Stephen Avery trial had questioned Dr. Eisenberg. Question, um, did you find any evidence of, um, of the superior aspect of an iliac blade? Answer, um, yes I did. And um, for everyone in the room but me, I'll show you where that is. Question. That's my next question. Answer. And um, question. Thank you. Bail me out. It's pretty obvious that Special Prosecutor Fallon had no idea about bones and bone morphology. Answer. The, um, the pelvis is made up of three different bones. The left hip bone the right hip bone and the sacrum which is the bone that sits at the base of the spine and actually is the lowest uh, lowermost portion of the spine and the iliac crest is this top area here what you actually feel if you rub your hand on your hip bone that's known as the iliac crest question all right now the bone that you suspected to be the iliac crest can you say to a reasonable degree of scientific certainty that that uh, is human bones no sir I cannot so therefore in one master stroke the state was able to rule this particular bone fragment pelvic bone fragment from evidence tag 8675 as potentially being human but not a hundred percent being human now what is interesting here is that special prosecutor Fallon never mentions evidence tag 8675 nor the Manitowoc County gravel pit now why is that the case is it because he wanted the judge and the jury to focus only on those human cremains that were found on the Stephen Avery uh, burn pit. Now, Dr. Eisenberg was also questioned about the sacral iliac articulation found at the Manitowoc County gravel pit. I continue. Question. Did you find evidence uh, or of a bone that's referred to as the sacral iliac articulation? Answer. Actually, those are two bones. It's where the right half of the sacrum or the lowermost part of the spine um, articulates. It's actually adjoined with the right side of the hip bone. Question. And in terms of that um, suspected bone fragment, can you say to a reasonable degree of scientific certainty that that was human bone? Answer. Um, I cannot. So hence, another master stroke, the state was able to rule out this particular bone fragment also coming from evidence tag 8675. Now, Dr. Eisenberg unbelievably failed to test the bones from the Manitowoc County gravel pits. And notice, one of the key roles of a forensic anthropologist is to determine or distinguish human from non-human remains. And that came from Dr. Eisenberg herself. So she was questioned about this. Have a look at the response. Question. Doctor, were you able to perform any other tests uh, on these bones to determine if they were of human origin? Answer, uh, no, there were no other tests that I performed. Question, and why is that? 
listen to the response very carefully. Um, I did not. Uh, there um, uh, there is the potential for um, using um, microscopes to look, for example, to try and confirm if suspected human bone might actually be human bone or animal bone. But given the condition of the remains, I did not believe um, that cutting into the bone uh, that they would survive that those kinds of tests and so I did not perform them. So by not testing the bones, in particular these two pelvic bone fragments, she was not able to be definitive or give a definitive answer whether those two particular pelvic cut bone fragments found at the Manitowoc County gravel pit were indeed human. Now what is amazing here is that she actually stated that all she had to do was use a microscope. Now every forensic anthropologist laboratory contains a multitude of microscopes and it's hard to believe that she did not examine these pelvic bone fragments microscopically. Now let's have a look at this particular bone in detail. That's the sacral iliac articulation and it was found at the Manitowoc County gravel pit. This is the bone that Dr. Eisenberg did not examine microscopically. But she must have forgotten something very important. Uh, this is the flip side of that bone and I read her answer and so using the long bone as an example may not be an accurate comparison. Secondly the thinness of the outside bone of these pelvic cut fragments is not inconsistent with the thickness I would expect to see relative to the honeycomb bone in humans. Well, it just so happens that this particular bone fragment had been sliced on both sides to reveal the internal structure of the bone. So these two arrows here show the linear cuts into this particular bone fragment. And you can clearly see the inside is made up of honeycomb bone known as trabecular bone. And you can see a very thin outside bone layer known as the cortical bone. This is exactly what you find which is typical and characteristic of bone morphology in a human being. All right, but what is amazing is that of course there were many human bone poles at the Manitowoc County gravel pit. As we can see over here, there were at least three and you can see the evidence tag numbers. Now I just want to remind you of how insidious this actually was because the state never addressed any one of these bones. And remember in Dr. Eisenberg's report, she had stated the following. She examined the bones that were found at the Manitowoc County gravel pit and she stated quite clearly that they were calcine human bone fragments. Most bone fragments are all cut bone fragments are human. Burn calcine human bone fragments with cut edges cut burned human bone and finally possible human burned cut pelvic fragments. Now what's amazing is that the state's own forensic anthropologist had identified cut human bone fragment cremains in the Manitowoc County gravel pit. Yet these were not discussed in the Stephen Avery trial. Why? It's unbelievable because remember Dr. Eisenberg had stated that all of the cremains that she had examined had come from one 
skeleton, one skeletal remain. So why did the state completely ignore all these bone fragments that only honed in on evidence tag 8675 and Dr. Eisenberg had the convenient get out clause by stating possible human burn cut pelvis fragments. However, the morphology of the bones clearly had demonstrated <laughs> that they were in actual fact human bones, not animal bones. And I would suggest that there's no way that Eisenberg, Dr. Eisenberg, would write an extensive report on those pelvic fragments if they were in fact from an animal like a deer. And a deer has a completely different morphological structure of the pelvis compared to a human being. So there had to be significant that she had spent a considerable amount of time discussing it in her report. All right, now we have Kathleen Zona here who clearly is very interested and same with Stephen Avery. They want to find out whose cremains actually are they at the Manitowoc County Gravel Pit. And Kathleen Zona had written several motions. And some of the points in those motions are quote. Therefore, the identification of the Manitowoc Gravel Pit bone fragments as Miss Hall Bucks is relevant and material because it would prove the murder and mutilation did not occur in a location tied exclusively to Mr. Avery. No reasonable try of fact could conclude that if Mr. Avery murdered and mutilated Miss Hallbuck in the Manitowoc gravel pit, that he would move her bones to his own burn pit and therefore thereby incriminate himself. Now, that's perfectly reasonable, and that's exactly what the defense tried to do. But obviously, it wasn't enough to convince both the judge and the jury. And the second point is this. If the new DNA testing identifies Miss Hallbuck's bones in the Manitowoc County gravel pit, two inferences are reasonable, namely... Mr. Avery is not the murderer, and the bones recovered from Mr. Avery's burn pit were planted. There is a reasonable probability that this new evidence would undermine confidence in the jury's verdict. Now, here's the frustrating thing as a scientist. We actually have the Andy Rapid DNA testing system, and potentially the bones can be tested and we can finally get an answer within about 90 minutes. All right, so Kathleen Zellner also stated the following. Now remember that she had hired a forensic anthropologist, Dr. Stephen Symes. I quote, Regarding the possible human pelvic bones, Dr. Stephen Symes would conduct the examination of those bone fragments with his electron microscope, which was constructed in 2013. Additionally, Dr. Symes would make histological slides of the bones, which would confirm the origin of these fragments with absolute certainty. Even if this examination could have been done with a 2005 to 2007 era microscope and histological slide, we still have the right to make an ineffective assistance of counsel argument against Mr. Buting and Mr. Strang for failing to perform these analysis. Now, we've got to remember here, let's forget about the science, but as a parent, you definitely want to know whether those cremains at the Manitowoc County Gravel Pit are indeed from your own daughter. As a matter of courtesy and respect, it is important to find out the origin. Who do those cremains actually belong to? Now, 
if this case didn't get any weirder, it just did. Because the actual state releases or released the human bones back to the Holbuck family in 2011. And if you read the CASA report, you can see that human bones from evidence tag 8318, which, from, which was from Stephen Avery's burn pit, human bones from evidence tag 7964, which were from the Yonder burn barrel number two, and human bones from evidence tag 8675 and 7412, remember, these evidence tags contained human or suspected human pelvic cut bone fragments. They're both from the Manitowoc County gravel pit in quarry pole number one. They were also given back to the Hallbuck family as well as human bones from other evidence tags. But what you won't find mentioned in the CASO reports is the Manitowoc County gravel pit. It's almost as though that particular geolocation did not exist. So we have the potential situation whereby all the critical bone fragments, especially the pelvic bone fragments, may have been given back to the Hallbuck family. So there may not be any human bones left to test. All right, so here's a few questions in regards to the human cremains that I'm sure most of you guys will be interested to know. Firstly, why did the state release burnt human bone fragments, known as cremains, to the Hallbuck family in 2011, when Special Prosecutor Kratz stated during the Stephen Avery trial back in 2007 that the cremains found at the Manitowoc County gravel pit were considered not evidence. And he made a huge song and dance and completely ignored those uh, human cremains that were found at the Manitowoc County gravel pit. Yet, amazingly, those bones were given back to the Horbach family. Was this, in actual fact, a blatant example of bad faith by the state? Kathleen Zona believes that it is. Here's a question I would love to get answered. And this is why I focused on the human pelvic bones. How does the state explain the presence of burnt human pelvic bone fragments in at least two separate geographical locations? For example, Stephen Avery's burn pit and the Manitowoc County gravel pit. If the state attests that Teresa Horbuck's body was burnt in the one location, Stephen Avery's burn pit, and all the cremains, as we know from Dr. Eisenberg, were from the one victim. Now, as an aside, when investigators Fassbender and Wiegert were grilling Brendan Dassey, they asked him to draw what he and his uncle Stephen had done to Teresa's body. And he had stated during uh, one of the uh, interrogation sessions that after Teresa uh, was uh, shot 10 times, they carried her body and they threw it into the burn pit. And he was asked to draw this. And if you remember from one of the videos that both Bron and I did, the picture that, that uh, Brendan Dassey drew was of a complete body, not body parts, but as a complete body that was placed in the burn pit. The, he never mentions the fact that the body was cut up with a blade or a saw. His diagram actually showed a body intact. So how could that possibly be? How do we find 
burnt human pelvic bone fragments in two completely different geolocations. It makes no sense whatsoever. And finally, the forensic microscopic examination of the Manitowoc County gravel pit, suspect human pelvic bone fragments, as well as the use of the Andy Rapid DNA system, would have resolved whose cremains they belong to. And the big question is, and even till today, why is the state stonewalling Kathleen Zellner and her experts to test the biological material? I suspect it's because there is no biological material to test. I leave you with this. The definition of deception. I quote, Deception is an act or statement which misleads, hides the truth or promotes a belief, concept or idea that is not true. It is often done for personal gain or advantage. So the question is, did the state's forensic anthropologist Dr. Leslie Eisenberg, did she use deception by cleverly stating that both pelvic bone fragments found in evidence tag 8675, which was found at the Manitowoc County gravel pit, by stating them as being suspect, not human, did she use deception to actually reveal or conceal the true nature of those bones. Were they in fact human? And what is frustrating is that when she was uh, um, questioned during the Stephen Avery trial, there was nothing to indicate in her responses that those pelvic fragments were indeed human. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you for watching. And during the presentation in both parts one and two, I utilize a variety of original documents. And you can see that in the, um, the Rubber Ducky Library, there's quite a lot of the original documents that you can find there. I also uh, use a Kathleen Zellner's Fold Motions. And if you want, you can go to the original websites uh, to get additional information. And at the end, we mustn't forget that the discovery of the origin of those pelvic bone fragments may indeed stand in the way of the freedom of both Stephen Avery and Brendan Dassey. We must never forget that. As usual, I'd like to thank Rubber Ducky and her fellow duckies for constant inspiration, passion, and for fruitful discussions. Many thanks for listening, and please remember, if you have any questions, please place them in the comment section, and I'll try to answer them as soon as I can. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was a very interesting presentation, Dr. Silkman. Thank you so much for sharing your time and your research with us. We greatly appreciate it. If you didn't do the crime, you shouldn't do the time.